Uh, no, you're right there. I'm okay there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't need to move any further to the left. Um, <laughs> um, Tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you for having me here. Um, when we were organising this event, we posed a few questions on the invitation, the, the registration site. One of them was about what does open government mean? And I think it's important to talk about that because we can talk about what it's here to address and so on, but unless we're clear about what open government means, uh, then we're not going to get very far. And the phrase has been around for a long time. Uh, the Danks Committee's report that led to the OIA in 1980 was called Towards Open Government. In 1993, as I was starting my career on access to government information in, in the UK, uh, the John Major government published a white paper called Open Government. So the phrase has been around for a long time, but it's actually shifted in meaning and... Uh, in the lifespan of the OGP, there's been increasing amounts of academic study as to define what do we mean by open government. And it's an important issue because in 2020, New Zealand passed the Public Service Act, which says that every chief executive of a government department is under a statutory duty to foster a culture of open government. So what are they supposed to be doing? Uh, and... Open government has three components. It's public participation in the development of policies and services. It's public accountability. And both of those pillars are resting on a foundation of access to government information, information that is held by public authorities in our name and who act on our behalf. Uh, so open government is fundamentally about the transfer of political power from executive government to the public and civil society so that they can participate in the governance of their own country and in the services they receive and hold governments to account. Or as Geoffrey Palmer wrote in Unbridled Power in 1979, information gives power to those who have it and deprives those who do not. So why is it important that we get this right? And I have a two-word answer, and it's called climate change. We can alternatively call it social cohesion and that may seem very distant. But governments everywhere are facing major problems that span generations of the population. We know that rationally the challenges of climate change and collapsing biodiversity, funding future pensions, the ongoing crises of access to ubiquitous public services of housing, health, education. And we know that many of those issues have been exacerbated by governments of all colors, kicking really difficult decisions down the road. You can argue it's a three-year electoral term, but I can tell you coming from a country with a five-year electoral term, it doesn't really matter what the length of your electoral term is. Governments put off taking difficult decisions because we have a democratic system that favours currying uh, opinion in the centre. But behind a lot of those issues are significant diverges both in the values that people have and the steps that we could take to address them. There's a huge difference between people who will protest on the motorway coming into Wellington saying we need more trains and farmers turning up for groundswell protests on tractors. There's a huge divergence of values there and approaches we can take to one of the biggest challenges we face. So open government, if it's taken seriously, and that means far more emphasis on public participation in designing the policies and services, are about helping us overcome the fractures that we face in society. Kia ora koutou. Ten years ago, now, I was invited to be the co-director for the publication of the Integrity Plus National Integrity Systems Assessment. I don't know how many of you have actually seen this. Um, and um, I thought this would become New Zealand's Bible because I thought that democracy was so strong in New Zealand and integrity was such an, a major part of how we see ourselves that everyone would want to read this document. I've been really uh, found out, of course. Um, but one of the um, 70 different recommendations that were in the document was that New Zealand should join the Open Government Partnership. And 
fascinating. We were invited to join from the beginning, September the 11th, um, 2011. And our government chose not to join. But when we started writing this report and the information got around government, before this report was published, New Zealand had joined. So we had to rewrite the whole section from the beginning where we'd said New Zealand is recommended to join open government to say New Zealand has joined open government. Then we were invited by the then uh, State Services Commission uh, to lead an exercise in terms of the first national action plan. And the first national action plan recommended that every single one of the 70 recommendations in this report be adopted and that they be progressed. And amongst those recommendations, Sanjay and Helen, um, was beneficial ownership. Um, and other recommendations which uh, were also very uh, widely promulgated at the time were political party funding. Um, the importance of freedom of the press, uh, the importance of lobbying um, being uh, controlled. Christine Lloyd, who's here tonight, um, had a lovely spreadsheet with all of the different recommendations on it. And we met every month to talk about how they might be progressed. And in 2018, Liz Brown and Julie Haggy um, put together an update, a five-year update on this. We had found that there were some changes made. Um, but quite frankly, the overriding perspective that was in this is that New Zealand is far too passive and complacent about these things that matter. As Helen said, the amount of resources in New Zealand which are lost because of our inability to address beneficial ownership are, are probably between 5 and 10% of our GDP at a minimum. Why does this happen? It happens because the nefarious out there love a vacuum. They love loose legislation. They love passive democracies. And uh, of course, they're aided and abetted by the fact that New Zealand has the seventh largest coastline in the world. So it's quite easy for people to come in and launder money and goods and services through our coastline, um, not to mention through our housing market. So I'd like to introduce, um, based on your uh, comments, Helmut, um, a new terminology that we somehow go away tonight and we replace passivity and complacency with effective energetic engagement. Um, I look here tonight and I think we were expecting an overfull house. Being Wellington, of course, we always know that we're all too busy and so you never get, even if you've got more people saying they're coming than do, you always end up with empty seats. So this is common. But again, you guys are extremely important because you understand the importance of democracy and the importance of strengthening democracy. And I suspect that like all of us here at the front table and in looking at your faces, I know, because I know most of you, you've all in your own way tried to push forward on something that really mattered in terms of changing the common good for New Zealanders. And you've all pushed really hard and you've pushed for many years. We could say that the last 10 years have been the most in incredibly unexpected 10 years in our lives. You know, it started out at the beginning um, with earthquakes um, and, uh, um, and a bit of um, climate change um, problems. And we've ended up in the last couple years, the last three or four years, with everything you can imagine. Locusts, pandemics, floods, cyclones, hurricanes. So we could use that as an, ex as an excuse. Um, but I'd like to think that we've now got to say we, it's getting too late. If you want to strengthen democracy, you've got to go around and go away tonight and be effective, energetic, and importantly, engaging so that 
more people than just those of us here tonight can make a difference. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. I absolutely failed. I let everybody run as long as they wanted, but I think it was really important to let you make your points and to uh, ensure everybody had their, their moment. Um, right, we're gonna start with the next section. Um, we still have plenty of time. Um, questions, so if you've managed to write any questions, we're gonna start gathering them up and um, I will do uh, the best I can to get no, as many on. Have we got one that started? Away. Okay, we'll start right away. So from Anna, what does effective engagement look like? How does the ordinary person on the street get involved and understand this? So that gets right at the heart, I think, of what we're talking about. Um, Sanjay, do you wanna have a start? There's the, the mic is coming. You know, open government is an intersection between um, transparent government and engaging government and an engaging citizenry. So engagement means both sides of the equation have to come together. Um, and uh, so how does, an, uh, how does an ordinary person, I mean, if that was the way, Barbara, you phrased it, um, yeah, I think it's about advocacy for locally homegrown issues that matter to you. And it's a responsive government that's listening and responding to you. So I'm just thinking, what are some uh, examples that we can, we can give which actually encapsulate it? I can give you some examples from around the world. So um, I'll take you to Italy. Um, Italy, uh, there was an investigative journalist who concluded that a lot of the EU funds that were meant for the southern part of Italy were not being utilized. And so what the government did is they actually decided in a effective, engaged, I forget the third E, uh, Suzanne, but they decided to proactively share um, on a platform which is called Open Coesione, um, details of get this, one million projects financed by the EU, financed by a total of 100 billion euros. That was the scale of the problem. And they disclosed it in open coercion and open data standards. So that was the government being, uh, you know, going out and reaching to the citizenry saying, these are the projects financed by the EU that is meant for you. But they didn't stop there. They then started this project called Monithon. Monithon was one of the biggest citizen mobilization projects where citizens were mobilized, youth were mobilized, and students were mobilized through high school competitions. There were high school competitions to track each of these projects which are locally relevant. So high school students got engaged in local projects where they started monitoring the funds that they were supposed to receive, which they could track in open data standards. So these students got engaged and they started to demand why, for instance, money that was meant for a refugee center was blocked by the mafia. And when st students start inquiring this, people start listening because it's a school project. Students got engaged, the government was listening, and the government started responding, unblocking the funds. I use this as an example of a dual engagement that you need, an engagement from government to citizens in opening up the space through transparency and openness for citizens to engage, citizens engaging on things that matter to them, which was, for instance, instance, these high school students in Bolsonaro, if I got the name correctly, um, uh, Bovalino, I think it was, um, they, they started agitating on the refugee center for migrants. So this is an example of engagement which needs to go both ways. And when there is a healthy, constructive combustion, you have better results. Thank you very much. Lots of questions coming in. Um, just picking ones that I think will be interesting, really, and no, uh, no favorites or anything. Um, and most people have not put their names to it, which is fine too. Um, we'll be sure to keep them all, and they might be really useful in terms of um, uh, gathering information. 
I just wanted to add that oh, yes. the Great. third word was an energetic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, as an economist, I'm really interested in data. One of the things that I've never seen in my life was the extent to which we were able to collect information about COVID um, and publish it d daily and have trends and be able to analyze both what was happening in the long term as well as the short term with the data that we had. It was an absolutely amazing amount of energy that went into that. What I think we need to see is the same sort of energy being put into each role that you play. Um, why is it that only with COVID that we were able to discover information about ourselves and about our health and well-being? Why can't we be using those same tools and other daily things that we do that matter to us as New Zealanders and matter to us as part of a democracy. And uh, Sanji, I guess the question to you is, it would be good if there could be a centralized tool that was happening as part of open government that countries could, could apply so that we don't all keep reinventing the wheel. It seems like social media has been able to do it very effectively, but not always for good, often for bad. How can we do it for good? Thank you. That's. Uh, I'll move move on. Yeah, let's move on. Okay, um, helmets. What specific forms or form do you see Porua Te Tiriti based assembly will take? What sort of form? What sort of forms or form it will take? Yeah, that's easy. So um, we we put out the call to the community leaders to come to Takapua here. We have a very large farikai. It's a big hall there, and we have facilitated engagement with them. And um, we, we tell Anoa about whatever it is we want to talk about. That's sort of like the tell Anoa, uh deliberative bit for the community leadership bit. Um, it's no more sophisticated than that. We'll figure it out as we go. Uh, that's why it's safe to fail. Uh, on, the, on the citizens assembly slash wānanga bit, so this is where it gets a little bit more juicy because our proposition is that we're, we're, we're uh, uh, repurposing the international model and, and applying a, a a treaty house model, right, where we've got, uh, the pr proposition is is that we've got a, a rangatiratanga house or assembly deliberating, and then we've got our tangatatiriti house that are deliberating, and then once we've done that, we'll come together, and then we'll compare notes and call it all until we've exhausted ourselves or agreed, or both, and then we'll we'll go for, go forward from there. So that's just, just a quick flavour, and uh, I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. I'm glad that we were able to expand a bit upon that. Um, here's a question that sort of reflects, I think, a number of the other questions as well. So the Britain civil society has invested significant effort in the past New Zealand action plans only for the government to reduce commitments to little more than existing programs. Why should we continue to engage? It seems our time is wasted. Who wants to have a go <laughs> at that? Andrew? <laughs> That's um, not easy. So one of the things you learn from a 30-year career in working in governance reform is that it's the triumph of hope over experience. Um, and I remain hopeful that intelligent people will grasp the fact that continuing as Einstein said, to do things the same way and expecting a different result is not you know, likely to, to work out for people. Um, one of the things that we need to confront in New Zealand is the, the structural weakness of our civil society compared to many other open government partnership member countries. Mm -hmm. And I did a little number crunching uh, a while back about the size of three NGOs in New Zealand compared to their counterparts in Ireland, which has the same population in the UK, which is obviously a lot bigger. Um, and I looked at the Council for Civil Liberties that I de I'm the deputy chair of at Transparency International and the umbrella body for civil society organisations in each country. And in New Zealand, the Council for Civil Liberties has zero full-time staff. We're all volunteers. In Ireland, they have 12 full-time staff and in the UK, 60. Transparency International in the UK has 43 staff, and in Ireland they have eight. And those kinds of 
major lack of resources for civil society organizations mean that when people want to get engaged in other countries, they might join a civil society organization and hope that it has the capacity to do that. In this country, it's a real struggle. And one of the reasons uh, that it continues to be a struggle is actually because we had a government in 2017 elected on a manifesto pledge to do a first principles review of charity law. And Sue Barker, who is sitting here in the audience, has done a major piece of work with a grant from the uh, Law Foundation about reform of charity law in New Zealand. And the government has simply said, oh, that's a good doorstep. We're going to do a little bit of incremental reform. And what that means is that we're going to continue in a situation where organizations that speak out on matters of political topics are denied charitable status. And in a country where resources are so tight, that continues to hobble civil society's ability to participate meaningfully. Does anybody else want to comment on that one? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I do. As part of a community that has intergenerational experience and been ignored uh, and impoverished and unable to get traction on public policies of, of, of you know, significant moment, I can tell you that uh, hope is not really uh, adequate in my view. And, and uh, while it, of course, is springs eternal and must be a part of the, the thing, uh, uh, my, my strong recommendation is uh, to actually uh, be determined to lift where you stand. Right, so, so our, our, uh, our NGO, our, uh, uh, tangata, uh, our, tangata, our, our The People Speak are just a handful of ordinary Kiwis who have put their minds and, and hearts to actually collaborating to catalyse uh, good things, and, and it's underway. Um, uh, you, get the, you get the flavour, right? I, I, I would strongly, strongly encourage us, if the kaupapa is powerful enough, uh, if it's that meaningful to us, we just need to be determined, tighten up our scrum, you know, uh, guilt everybody into doing the right thing, drag the philanthropic dollar, the whatever dollar. The, 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 the currency that the politicians pay attention to is, uh, excuse me, is a former one here, is of course, is of course uh, uh, you know, political currency, attention. Votes. They want to be around winners, people who are doing stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that would be my strong encouragement is to be focused on lifting where you stand, being the change. We want to see, make good stuff happen. The politicians will come. Promise. Sanjay, he wants to make a Yeah, I, um, I would just urge to this question that for civil society, uh, so I've been here for a couple of days and even before that I had some information, but even in talking to people I understand the frustration that civil society have experienced. I do want to say not to lose hope and not to lose faith because uh, the, the OGP co-creation process was structured in a way that needed reform and the government has decided to reform the multi-stakeholder forum so they're actually working on it and very specifically um, there is uh, an unusual design in New Zealand which is on the expert uh, advisory panel which are experts advisors to government on a confidential basis that needs to be opened up because if if, ex if civil society um, has to work on a confidential basis, it defeats the purpose of their role in soliciting broader community input both ways, which informs the, uh, the OGP co-creation process. So that needs to be opened up. But more broadly, what I've suggested is that, and it's open, that we have in OGP uh, 10 years of experience in these multi-stakeholder forums. And that 10 years, we have a re research report with actual data and evidence, which we can share with anyone. And it shows that when you have robust and equal co-creation between government and civil society, the reforms are more ambitious and the results are stronger, which means that the, uh, the co-creation process, the multi-stakeholder forum in, in New Zealand needs to, re needs, to, needs to be reformed, which is what the government also wants to do. And it's, it's doing a review right now to that effect to make it uh, more equal between government and civil society, to broaden the base of both government agencies and civil society that, in, that uh, engage in the OGP process, and to make this process open. So as we'll have to see which way the, the actual reform of the multi-stakeholder forum goes, but that will lead to 
hopefully better satisfaction and better outcomes from the stakeholders involved. Thank you very much. I think we could squeeze in a couple of more questions. This is actually somewhat related to what you've just said, um, Sanjay. What non-legislative steps can be taken to improve transparency? I'm wondering, um, Helen or Andrew or Suzanne maybe have some ideas. What non-legislative non -legislative steps can be taken to improve transparency? So, Transparency is an interesting word, um, and it gets, you, it gets chucked around a lot, but um, it's almost seen as if you say we're open and transparent, that's what's happening, and it's taken to be we publish documents. But transparency is not an act of publication, it's an act of communication. Okay, There's no point just putting cabinet papers across 25 different government department websites if your intention is actually to communicate information to people. And we saw this during COVID when the government said, yeah, we don't want to have to send people to MSD and to the Ministry of Health and so on to get the relevant information that they needed in order to respond during that crisis. They set up a new website, put all the information there. Right? And last year, the Public Service Commission and the Minister, Chris Hipkins, took a paper to Cabinet to say, we'd like to make some changes to how Cabinet papers, which, you know, big feather in their cap, and it is important, right? Not many other countries are publishing Cabinet papers. Um, how that happens. And they said, we think this should be on a centralised website where everybody knows where to go and to find these Cabinet papers. And Cabinet said no, right? It's, and I find that mind-blowing. Um, because if you say we want to build a modern digital public service and we want to make information available, we want to be transparent and communicate this information, basic tool is make it easy to find. Okay? And we see in, the co in privacy law a concept called a privacy impact assessment. How is a new policy or proposal going to impact on the privacy of people whose data is going to be collected? but we don't have policy tools in this country called information access assessments. And just as we have regulatory impact assessments and human rights assessments when papers go to cabinet, we could build into our policy processes how are we going to do, make sure that the information is available to people who need it? Is it the right information they need in order to participate or to hold us to account? Does anybody else want to respond to that one? We are coming towards the end, and oh, sorry, Sanjay. Yeah, go just, ahead. Uh, you know, actually, there are uh, many, many examples of non-legislative transparency measures which really empower people. You don't need legislation. I'll give you. I like to think in terms of stories. So, have you heard of the Bristol baby scandal? Any of you? Bristol baby scandal. <laughs> so it was. It was in the in the UK, and there was a royal infirmary in Bristol where an audit found that the mortality rates of babies was much higher in that, in that hospital rather than other ones, uh, which was really shocking because babies were dying and it was, it was actually lives, babies' lives at stake. So medical doctors in that infirmary, not through any legislation, decided that they needed to start publishing mortality rates in these hospitals. Again, no legislation. That simple act of publishing mortality rates across hospitals then created a virtual competition where every infirmary had to, had to publish these dates. And there is, this was over a period of seven, eight years when parents armed with this, in, this information, pure proactive disclosure, mm -hmm. started taking decisions to take their baby, uh, the babies elsewhere based on the information that they were getting in terms of where the mortality rates were lower. There's a whole study done that this actually saved a bunch of lives if you just look at the statistical analysis that is done. It's a simple act of things, and it was accessible in terms of what Andrew was saying, it was accessible, it was relatable, it mattered to the citizenry, it mattered to the parents, and they were able to take. So there are many such examples, uh, and Andrew, you're an expert in right to information, but in most of these right to information things, there is a, 
a clause on proactive disclosure of information. And there's a lot more scope, I find, in reformers around the world when I go, where reformers decided, look, I need to just publish this and arm citizenry so they can take their decisions. So don't wait for legislation. It's a much longer process. There's a lot more that reformers and activists can demand and reformers can do, which can save lives or do other good things that we want public services to do. Thank you, Sanjay. Excellent examples. Um, I'm going to go slightly off piste. We're near the end. So instead of me really wrapping up, I'd like all of our panelists, this is a bit of a risk, but no more than 20 seconds to give your final messages. You've already said them in some, in some senses. Maybe there's sort of key, key thing you would like to tell everyone as we go out to have a drink. That's a challenge, isn't it? But who would like to start? <laughs> Andrew, no? Helen, would you like to start? Uh, there's just uh, one point that wasn't developed much, but is obviously quite important, and that's uh, where the charity law needs to go. Um, and I think perhaps we need to draw on experiences of other you know, like-minded countries, as it were, as to how it's designed, because it, it, it is somewhat stifling at, at the moment. Uh, you know, on the other hand, <laughs> and I'll show my bias here, I mean, do, is families first with the sort of activity it has a charity? I mean, wh where do you draw a line between uh, those who are, you know, simply there for the sort of purposes they have and, and a, perhaps more of a public interest purpose? So I'd be interested in seeing, you know, s some more debate about the charity law and how it, how it should be reformed. Thank you. 20 seconds. OK, 20 seconds. Wow. I'm keeping okay. people from the uh, uh, Very quickly. Questions. Last week, the Prime Minister stood up and said, we're going to do a policy review on lobbying law. Uh, the OGP has in its rules the ability to add a new commitment to an action plan after it's adopted. They call them challenge commitments. Uh, the, the Prime Minister should say, we will put our policy development on lobbying law into our open government action plan and de deliver, develop it with deliberative public pu participation, because this this law reform needs moral authority, not simple technocratic rules. Thank you. So going back to my three E's, effective energetic engagement. Um, from the very beginning, when the recommendation was made that New Zealand join Open Government Partnership, it was also recommended that there be a multi-stakeholder forum um, and that it be well represented by civil society. Um, so I'd just like to leave that idea with everyone here is um, let's try to reduce passivity and complacency and actually can have dialogue and put ourselves into positions where we don't always agree with each other and a multi-stakeholder forum would be such a good way to move forward. I'll double down on my um, uh, efficacy observation um, and just um, um, uh, champion, I guess, the, the idea of, of strengthening our democracy through subsidiarity. When we couldn't actually get the vaccine out to everyone, it wasn't until trusted voices, faces and places in the community were drawn into the ecosystem of civil society that we got anything approximating to effective ubiquity, right? So to me, the, the principle for change going forward is to think through, find opportunities to implement that principle of subsidiarity, uh, and by definition, in my view, that will end up filtering back through the whole ecosystem and change it. That would be my encouragement. Thank you, Helmut. And Sanjay? So New Zealand uh, really can be a global leader in democracy and openness that our world really needs today. But in order to get there, it needs to stretch in a few areas like lobbying, like beneficial ownership, and like improving its domestic co-creation process. With the collective efforts of all of you, as Suzanne said, gathered here, I'm sure it'll get there and it'll be a shining star for us. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the panelists. And there's a pile of questions here. We only got through a few. We obviously need a lot more time. But um, that's our, the extent of it for this evening. We have a few more minutes together outside. We will keep all the questions, and they'll um, inform uh, some of our panelists' work. Um, and um, we'll take that forward. So kamua, kamuri. This evening, we've looked back in order to move forward. 
So let's take that energy and the passion for this topic and really um, engage where we can and move forward. Hare rai. Thank you very much.